Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shop Talk, hosted by the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. So tonight we have with us the usual cast of characters. Directly this way from me, Mala Mahadevan. How you doing, Mala? Good evening, everybody. I'm doing good. Good. Excellent. And in that kind of direction, we've got Mike Christensen. How you doing, Mike? Very well. Hello, everybody. I'm actually a little bit surprised that both of my head movements were in the correct direction this week because normally I get that backwards where I'll be like, yes, going, I mean, this way. <laughs> but it seems that I've been doing this long enough that I remember. Point the opposite direction, except in a case like this when it's pointing the same direction. So I've kind of almost got it down um, at least 50% of the time. How you doing, Raj? Good to see you again. Now, Shop Talk, this is your first time here. This is a very, mm, I'd say it's a little bit theme-driven show, but it's mostly water cooler chat. It's basically a chance to unwind after a Monday having to get back to work and talk about some tech stuff. If you have questions in chat, drop them in here. Otherwise, we look forward to talking to you about some fun topics tonight. So a few weeks ago, we talked a bit about Print Nightmare and the follow-up print spooler issues where there were at least three of them. It turns out that there is an update on the Print Nightmare patch. So specifically for Print Nightmare, not on one of the follow-up other attacks that were completely unrelated. But Bleeping Computer has a good article about the author of um, the researcher behind Print Nightmare has a patch that bypasses um, Microsoft's patch for Print Nightmare. And you can take uh, a print driver and get local system access based off of that. So seems kind of fun. Um, you know, that whole thing that Microsoft put out like several separate major patches over the course of July and are probably going to have to patch again. If you go to the URL, there's actually a website that you could go to. Basically, you can access the print server directly in case you want to. I don't think this is a good idea, but you can, you can access it and install a print driver. Incidentally, Windows Defender will protect you from installing that particular print driver. But if you disable Windows Defender, which again, I don't think you should, but if you decide to for research purposes, uh, you can install their driver, which will get system access. And that's not how print drivers are supposed to work, allowing you to run arbitrary code as a more privileged account than you currently have. But, uh, yeah, so as far as feedback goes, I think that might be Mike having the speakers up a little bit high. Sorry, Enhanced QC, we'll, we'll work on getting that a little bit better. So, uh, check that link out. It is kind of interesting and also says that we are not going to see the last of print spooler problems with Windows. I, I can imagine that we'll have a few more rounds of it, especially because we haven't even hit the major security conference season yet. And I would expect to see a couple more of these at uh, some of the cons that are coming up in, in the fall. All right, I just wanted to do that quick update. Anyone lose audio? No, no, we all just sat here awkwardly for a moment to try to make it look like you had lost audio, Red Nello. But I had to double check to make sure I, I didn't mute myself. I tend to, I tend to mute myself a lot. Uh, sometimes it's on purpose. So speaking of Mike, uh, our next topic, we're going to talk about using lookup tables. This is something that Mike has uh, spent some time working on and wanted to give him a chance to talk about it.
We'll give him a chance to talk about it as soon as he's ready to talk you, about it. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're you coming through. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know why I would be. I don't know why I have the echo. Time is crazy. So the issue that came up for me was um, we have a common um, business process whereby we do um, kind of custom SQL for clients. So in, in, in our setting, it's uh, we have about 25,000 tables. Um, we have a just a, a vast array of medical data that you can get. So we do a project and the project might be vitals, appointments, uh, billing, what have you. And at the end of the day, we give our clients um, data. We often export data so that they can do work in SAS or Stata or other different products. Sometimes we use the database if it's large, larger on data objects. Again and again, we write data dictionaries for our clients. And I get really, I get bored doing them because it's a kind of like a non-value add kind of task. So I was like, I wonder if I could automate this. Um, and so all the stuff that we've talked about at this group or some of our meetings, I said, okay, there's gotta be a way to do this. So I started researching common lookup tables to say, you know, is this a, a potential solution where essentially I can take my work product, which is uh, some SQL, and create a lookup table by which if your my column matches this lookup table column, then bring back the column that has a definition for that. So um, I thought about different ways of doing it, and then I started looking into uh, um, would that be a recursive one? Like, would I would I do the, cr the cross apply uh, multiple cell joins? And then I said, I don't think I need to do that. So this is a I don't know what the sim the equivalent would be in SQL Server, but essentially, the to have a a value come back as the value of a column. So if the column is like um, type underscore C, um, and it's like a numeric um, value i can pull back for that table the um column uh the column or attribute name as a result and then i join it to this lookup table so um that ended up working really really well so um we've written probably 50 data dictionaries so i kind of like taking all the data dictionaries that we've created as like, exports for our clients load them all into this common lookup table and then delete the duplicates that are, you know, some people write type underscore C, this is the type of encounter and somebody just says encounter type, you know, so somebody has a better definition than another person. <laughs> so we grab the best definition and I just delete the rest of the column. So now when I've done this work and my columns match any of the columns in this, I can just export the, 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 you know, the, Varchar 5000 text, what is the definition of the column? So that was a, I, I wanted a solution. I wasn't sure it was common lookup tables, but it works well enough. So that was why I wanted to bring it up. Um, and then I know you had some additional expertise with some of the super lookup tables. So when, when you're talking lookup tables in that case, it sounded like you had a data dictionary where it was, Essentially, here is the column name, here is the definition of what that column represents. Is that correct? Yes, that's not in the, in the, in the yeah, so I uploaded that to the database. So now in the database, there's this table that like Mike's definition table and it says type C and then next to that, then the second column is like the, the definition of type C. So type C is like type underscore C is a column we use all the time. So I join that column to this Mike's data dictionary on the column attribute name. And I don't know how you do it in SQL Server. It's DBA tab columns. So it's, it's a DBA function that you can grab the call, grab an object's name. I mean, an object's column can be grabbed as a result. Mm. So DBA, DBA tab columns dot column name. Right, right. Okay. Okay. That's 
interesting. That's a little bit different from you know, how I think we talk about lookup tables. Generally, we think about reference tables of here are, for example, say admission criteria, and here are the admission criteria for uh, an admission, for a patient admission, um, and which ones of these were met. Or, for example, a transfer reason. You were transferred from one facility to another facility. Or discharge reason. Why were you discharged from this facility? And that ranges everything from I got better to I didn't get any better, uh, right. so to speak. And so those would be things where we might store the reference values, the reference data, and join to that reference data where discharge I reason ID six represents six feet under. Um to be a little macabre. And <laughs> then we now have a way of reducing the number of string references, number of strings in uh, fact data, or getting rid of some amount of textual duplication. And that's where I think a lot of people normally go when you talk about lookups. Uh, this is a little bit different. It's kind of interesting. It's yes, yes. It, you're right. Like I'm, get, I'm even getting the concept kind of wrong. But I, I was thinking of a lookup table to be a solution. And what I, I guess what I did was I just created another table. It's, yeah, it's well, not I mean, really a lookup table per, per at se. At the end of the day, that's all a lookup table is. It's just another table. It's a table that has some set of data that references something else. But. Uh, the lookup tables can be very, very helpful. And I think this happens in a lot of people's minds where you start building out some lookup tables, some reference tables, and you say, well, gee, I have nine of these, 12 of these, 15 of these, 40 of these. And it just feels weird that I'm building out the same table over and over because all it has is an ID and a name and maybe it's got a description or you know one other field to it but usually it's some id some name primary key on the id unique constraint on the name and that is my lookup table and i load data into it and so if i'm doing that 50 times uh, as developers we start thinking that seems like unnecessary repetition and we could store all of it in one table and just have that one true lookup table, which by the way, is a name of an anti-pattern, the one true lookup table anti-pattern. So I wanted to get into where that can serve us poorly. And as an example of where that struck me early on in my career, um, before I was actually even a database person, I was a developer, web developer and working on a project and this project had actually related to uh, behavioral health so it was in it was in that field where admissions and discharges and transfers and the like were all of importance well there were literally dozens of reference tables for this database and developer me at the time said why don't i just have one reference table, one lookup table that includes all of them. That way, if we have a new reference table that comes in later, you know, I don't have to do the development effort to create this table and load it up separately. And that's just a lot of extra work when I can insert a few more rows. This idea works to an extent. And uh, it, it basically, begins to fail as the number of replacement tables increases or replaced tables increases. And essentially um, database engines do not like joining to the same table dozens of times. There was a cutoff, there was a particular cutoff and I don't remember exactly what the number was, but below that number, a query would be just fine. And then you add one more join to that, that one true lookup table and suddenly the optimizer just chokes. And 
that is a problem with this anti-pattern. That is, that is what eventually happens. You have so many joins to this one table that uh, the optimizer eventually protests and quits. So Solomon says, unnecessary duplication until business requirements diverge. True. And um, that, that could possibly happen where some of the lookup tables end up needing additional attributes later on. But in a lot of cases, they usually don't. SQL Server developers also like the idea of one true lookup table, as that is what the internal master SPT underscore values table is, says Solomon. Yet yeah, this pattern is vexatious. It is, it is something that, like a siren's call, I think developers are drawn to it because it's a way to reduce repetition and we won't have to go through change processes to get a new reference table. I just have to insert a few more rows and I can do that using a web tool. So it feels like it's going to save you a lot of time. And in cases where you only have to join to the one true lookup table once or twice, then that can work out. I think that there's still a lot of benefit in having the domain information that you have a separate reference table, especially when you start getting into domain modeling, where if you have, for example, uh, imagine a database design where I've got my one true lookup table, and then I have, say, dozens of table replacements in there. And I may have seven or eight joins, seven or eight foreign key constraints from my um, admission table into this one true lookup table. And that design, that, that data model looks hideous because now you've got seven lines going from one table to another table. There's a, somebody trying to understand a data model, not gonna be very helpful. Whereas if you start bringing in, say this is um, admission reason as a table, discharge reason as a table, usually admission and discharge reasons will not be, they'll be disjoint sets. Um, but you may have other things like, oh, uh, conditions at time of admission, conditions at time of discharge. So, that may be things like hypertension, hypotension, uh, type two diabetes, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those conditions could be the same. And now I could see very easily in a, in a properly designed data model that both of them connect to this, this conditions. Um, the actual model would look a, a little more complicated than, than this, but I think that we can, visualize that having separate reference tables will make it easier to understand a domain model versus having one reference table and dozens or hundreds of links into it. And that assumes, by the way, that you have all of those foreign key constraints set up appropriately, which not always an assumption we can make. Uh, so, Mike asks, doesn't everything get much more efficient the bigger it gets in a single database, or is there a collision space time trade-off? The short answer is that there are some efficiencies with economies of scale. As you increase the size of a table, certain things become viable, certain techniques become viable that can make uh, things that can make, say, querying data or processing data faster than, uh, relatively speaking, it would be in a lot of small tables. But in those are, I think, heavily outweighed by the increases in the level of activity necessary to get the right information and to work with that information. So. As a, as a quick example, if you have a row, let's say you have a table that has 50,000 rows, your clustered index, assuming you choose something that's 
fairly sane, like an uh, int or maybe a big int, your clustered index is going to have two levels. Uh, you'll have basically your, your top page, and if I remember right, at about 50,000, you won't even have an intermediate page. You'll, go, you'll be able to go straight to the leaf. You might have an intermediate level. As you increase that further, up to about 27 million or so, you'll have another, you'll have another page uh, level. And then above roughly 27 million, this is all by memory, so I could be wrong on numbers, but you'll have additional levels to your B tree, meaning that in order for me to find a single row, I'm going to have to start up here, navigate to this level, this page on this level, to this page on this level, and that will take me down to the uh, raw, the base data where I'm able to get the information that I need. So as you have more rows, you'll need more levels of that B tree. And it grows fairly slowly. I mean, you're, uh, I remember 27 million being about the cutoff for three levels. And then you get into billions for four levels and then much, much higher for five levels. But, um, the end result there is that each lookup is now going to take five pages or four pages versus two pages for a small table. So having more data uh, will have its additional costs. And obviously, if you have to scan a range of data, a large range of data, that's going to have a major performance impact as well. Uh, Solomon says, it's actually very hard to foreign key one true lookup table to various child tables in order to constrain a range of lookup rows to the child tables where they should be used so that one table can't use rows that aren't valid for it. So for example, a status column in table A shouldn't be able to use country code rows. That is another really good point. That's another case where you can easily run into a problem. The foreign key constraint itself won't be able to tell you no, I, I only allow this, this range. I suppose you could also use a check constraint if you knew the IDs. Um, you might materialize the one true lookup table as a set of indexed views and then have key constraints to them maybe. It starts getting weird. But yeah, that's a really good point that I can say I have a foreign key constraint to my lookup table, but you lose some of the benefit of the key constraint, which is ensuring that your value is in fact valid that you have chosen. So are there tools that will play what if games to optimize uh, LUT sizes used to avoid problems? Not of the sort that we're talking about um, because or do you just need to know? I think I think a lot of it is yes, you just need to know. Some of it is you just you deal with it. So for example, when we're talking about a table that has billions of rows, you, know, you have a few possibilities of how you can deal with it. And in a relational database, easiest answer is you deal with it. You put it in one table, you write queries that are that are uh, well designed that use indexes appropriately and that retrieve the smallest number of records necessary to perform an operation. Another option is something that you may see quite often with um, time series type data where you split it up into partitions by time range. You'll see this quite often in warehouses and or in fact tables where if I have a date key I might partition that by date and either explicitly partitioning it where I have one table for every month and I create the new table, I load the table for that month, I create a new table for the next month. Or using partitioning technologies like SQL servers uh, partitioning, which under the covers create a partition function and split this up into different uh, files based on the partition sequence. By dealing with it, do you mean live with bad performance as long as it doesn't suck enough to fix? That's one way to live with it. I mean, another, the other ways to live with it, like I was saying, write better queries or 
a little more tactfully, writing queries which understand the nature of the data, understand the types of problems that you're trying to solve, and optimizing tables to access data in that way most effectively, or rearranging data in some fashion to make it easier to solve those types of problems. You know, there, there comes a point where at some, at some point you're going to have to deal with, if I have a trillion rows, um, no matter how I store this, there's going to be some pain somewhere. And that pain could come from if I put it all in one table and I try to query it all. Yeah, uh, suboptimal queries can take a really long time to finish because you have to scan through that trillion rows. If I break it out into a lot of different tables, I may have to access a lot of different tables to get that information. And you can run into problems here when you start talking about distributing out data across multiple tables, and even across multiple servers. I mean, you, you get into some of the problems of distributed computing, which will involve how can I efficiently ask the questions of multiple machines that have separate data? Uh, how can I get those results back, collate them? What happens if I need to combine data across machines? And what happens if I have a relatively high percentage of data on one machine relevant to my request, but that doesn't exist on the other machines? There are technologies that have helped us address some of these. That's a big part of where Apache Hadoop, where Spark, uh, where these sorts of technologies have kind of pushed and trying to answer many of those difficult questions around clusters. So at the end of the day, you're going to have some pain somewhere and it becomes a factor of what type of pain would you rather experience and what is the, what is the necessary amount of pain in order to solve the problems that you need to solve. So Mala, you're saying if time is a constraint, that may be true. You've worked in a shop where you've been asked to leave less than ideal performance alone because it was manageable and that was good enough. And I'm gonna defend that, not just as, as a manager who doesn't wanna do anything, but as a developer, performance is a measure, it is not the measure. And as data platform specialists, we can get very focused in on optimizing performance because that is an action that we can take, which is concrete, which is measurable, which is uh, fairly easy to put into a box in the sense of, I can spend one day working on this query and get it from 900 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds. And I can easily report that to everybody. Hey, look, we saved 500 milliseconds per call on this query. And this query gets called 500,000 times per day. So we've saved all of this time, all of the server time. That's something which as software, it's data platform people, I think we're innately drawn to because it is concrete and you can put measures around it. You can understand the net result. It is very straightforward. There's, there's really not much in the way of gray area around it. But that's not the only consideration. It's not the only factor. If, if that day that you spent performance tuning, uh, you could have been solving some important other thing. Like I need to add this new feature for a customer. I need to fix this data that's uh, bad, or I need to do something else that will end up getting the company more money than what saving this will net us. Then, it can end up being not the best idea. And there are marginal improvements. You know, if let's go back to the 900 milliseconds. All right, if I'm calling this two and a half million times per day or whatever, then going from 900 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds for a day's worth of developer time probably isn't that bad. But if it's called 500 times per day, at that point, uh, the net effect probably isn't worth the developer spending all of that time working on it. 
especially if you do introduce the risk that the changes you make could break the query, could break the procedure, could end up introducing a downstream data problem that you weren't aware of. So that is, it is something that I think um, we as operators will focus on because it is easy for us to box, measure, and declare success, especially relative to some of our other goals, like making product managers happy or making customers happy or uh, delivering features, delivering necessary features for a sprint to improve downstream sales. Those are all much fuzzier metrics, fuzzier concepts that we're not able to control as well. And so we'll gravitate toward the stuff that we can control. Evolution occurs in every organization. Data grows to consume all capacity. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, data will grow over time. Um, there's somebody who's got a tongue in cheek rule about that and I forget who it is, but yes, data will grow to fill every drive. And that's just, just the way things work. So Mike, you've got a book as well, since we talked about the one true lookup table. Yes, let's see. So that is SQL Anti-Patterns by Bill Carwin. Here is a link to the book. Uh, have you had a chance to read that yet? No. You have not? Okay. Uh, Mala, have you read SQL Ante Patterns? Oh, you're on mute, though. I, I had to mute you to stop the echo. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, Kevin, it's an old book. I have read it, but a long time ago. And I still have it with me, which means I found it <laughs> worthy of keeping. Uh, but i sorry, I don't remember exactly what to speak about it right now. I do remember it was a good book, though. And it's been at least more than five years old, and that's way far behind for me to recall. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the book was published yeah. in uh, 2010. So the one issue that I had with the book was that the titles are a little bit cutesy. In the sense that some of them, some of them were pretty clear. Entity attribute value, polymorphic association, um, rounding errors, phantom files. These are readable passwords, SQL injection. So those are chapter names that make a lot of sense. But then you'll have things like jaywalking, naive trees, or metadata tribbles, and pseudo key neat freak. Making things bricks that, without straw. Yeah, it's like th these are chapter titles that I think I might recall what he was talking about, but they don't necessarily uh, tell a great story. They're not, they're not strictly clear. And aside from that, though, uh, the book was excellent. I do highly recommend it. It is more of a general purpose SQL guide as opposed to T-SQL specifically. If I remember right, I think a lot of them were, a lot of his examples were either Postgres or Oracle or maybe MySQL. So it's MySQL and Postgres, that's right. Okay. So with that, there will be some differences in flavors of SQL and in functionality. The book was written in, or published in 2010. So each of those data platforms has had 10 years of evolution since then. There have been new pieces of functionality, new optimizers, new cardinality estimators, a lot of different, say, improvements in the, the landscape. But the principles he talks about, I think, still apply very well. And I would recommend going and picking up a copy. Uh, it's, it's worth your time. The anti-patterns, are common enough that yeah, I don't think many of those are extremely uncommon. I think that a lot of us end up falling into them pretty frequently. And so, yeah, go check it out. It's been a while since I've read it as well. It's probably been 
seven years, maybe eight years since I've read it. But I'm sure I've still got a copy of it somewhere in I have, I have a copy. Somebody is actually right behind me. Yeah. I don't keep many tech books around for a very long time. And if I do keep them, they're worth keeping. So there you go. Got Mala's seal of approval. <laughs> so next up, we got an email not too long ago from, from Mark, who I don't think he's in chat tonight, but one of our many Marks who show up in chat, and we enjoy having him around. Um, do recent versions of SQL Server come with the ability to use regular expressions like from the .NET framework? And short answer is no. Long answer is yes, because yes has more characters than no. Um, so the way that it would work, there are actually a couple of techniques. And the first technique dates back to 2005, and that is to use the Common Language Runtime, CLR. There, from that, you can implement your own uh, methods in C-sharp or vb.net, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, since he's in chat, I, it would be rude of me not to put a, drop in a link to Solomon's SQL Sharp. SQL Sharp is a library, it's a, yeah, it's a library that includes quite a few CLR style modules, includes a whole set of regular expression functions and procedures. That's going to make it a lot easier than writing your own CLR methods that access the uh, .NET regular expressions libraries. Newer versions of SQL Server give you another option as well. And that is to use SQL Server Machine Learning Services. If you're using SQL Server 2016, you can write queries using R. 2017, they included Python. 2019, they included Java. And also opened up the extensibility framework to allow for other languages. But if you really want to have your regular expressions written using Python, for example, you can use machine learning services feed the data into Python, have Python parse that data, and return back results. I would say that it is not fast because it's taking data from a SQL Server, sending it over to some other process, executing that process you know, outside of SQL Server, returning that data back to SQL Server, operating on that data within SQL Server again. If you have a lot of data, that movement, even within processes on a single server, is going to take time. So not the type of thing that you might want to have in a near real-time system where I have to get answers immediately and I'm scanning through large data sets. For that, CLR is probably going to be a better choice for you. But even so, um, there are going to be limits to how well regular expressions will perform to begin with. And given that you're going out to .NET Framework, um, you know, there will be some level of overhead there too. But given that you can't really use much in the way of regular expressions otherwise, uh, Cost you got to pay, I suppose. Within T-SQL, yeah, external scripts are not flexible, especially compared to SQL CLR. This is true. There is a particular shape that data should be in. You're going to have one input result set. You can have one output result set. And there are limitations in the, uh, the data types that you're allowed to use. There are some fairly stringent limitations. For example, going to Python, Python does not support the decimal data type. So if you have data stored as decimal, you actually have to convert it to something like float to send it in. If you're working off of... I like my expression of that. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was some pretty good uh, face acting. Somebody should have thought of that. 
Well, I guess it's it's just that Python doesn't have this type. So, and many of the cases for using ML services is, are around data science where I don't necessarily need exact values. If I have floating point rounding, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Um, so I guess that's why it just didn't come up as important to them. Otherwise, so it would have implicitly converted to float, I suppose. I find regex easy to use in PowerShell. That's the only place I've used it. Yeah, well, the same. So the same uh, regular expression libraries are available in all .NET languages. The ones you're using in PowerShell, you're going to be able to use C Sharp, F Sharp, DB.NET, COBOL.NET. Or you want to call out for those of us still using COBOL.NET. Also, external scripts are stored procedure only API, whereas SQL CLR allows for creating functions so that can be used in line in queries. Yeah, that is another particular aspect of external scripts. You call SP execute external script. And going back to my, my defense of ML services there, that's intentional. Um, if you had a function call out for every, oh boy, you called out for every row, you would be spinning up a separate Python instance or uh, R term and performing operations. That would get scary. I mean, it's, it's bad enough that you have the, usually a, a multi-second startup time, but incorporate that in every row and it would hurt. It would hurt on a visceral level. Python has integers. Nobody uses them, though. Uh, but everything's an object in Python and is castable. Yeah, they have integers, but not the decimal data type, I believe. And so, essentially, you just use, you use float. And, again, for data science operations... Uh, okay, infinite rational. Yeah, I, I may be... I'm using the T-SQL equivalent. So in T-SQL, it's a float, and then it gets casted over to the appropriate type in Python. What will happen to CLR when we move toward .NET Core? That's a good question. Um, that is a really good question. And, you know, given that there hasn't been that much love for CLR within SQL Server, the, the team that developed CLR, um, A, I'm pretty sure they're not a team anymore. Uh, B, I don't know how many of those people are actually still around. You know, you're talking about 15 years old now. And C, we've, we've seen cases where .NET changes have come in and uh, the response has been, let's try to change SQL Server as little as possible to be able to support these .NET framework changes. Avoiding what they've done with security. Um, I, know, I know Solomon has some very strong opinions about the way they mishandled the uh, changes in module security that the, the .NET team introduced. Um, but yeah, they may let SQL CLR die. That's quite possible. And in that case, it will be interesting to see if they replace it with anything and if so, what they might replace it with. And I'm, at this point, I don't know. It could be that they want to use the extensibility framework uh, for those types of cases. But, you know, like Solomon is saying, that uh, this is not going to be a good answer for everything. Now, I will say that for regular expressions in particular, yeah, it's probably not a good answer. Um, because you're wanting to look row by row and, for example, perform a filter. Show me the cases where this regular expression pattern is matched in this descriptive text. So instead of performing this operation row by row iteratively like you would want, ML services is going to require you to uplift all of the data, move it over, 
and then it will perform the row by row operation itself and then return back to you all of the data. Not necessarily uh, going to be something that performs well, especially as data sets get larger. If you're talking about a few thousand rows or some very fast operation or a one-off job that, you know, I, I just need to get this done once, uh, performance won't matter nearly as much. But if this is part of a, an application, maybe a batch job that runs every hour to search for reports that have some attributes that need filled in or, you know, something like that. This is where CLR ends up being a lot better for uh, SQL Server users. If you're in Postgres, life gets a bit easier because just write a function that's in some other language. What's the deal with Windows 11? Mike, that's a good question. Uh, Microsoft you did say, it's say like Seinfeld, though, I think, don't you? Yes. What's yes. the so, deal? So what you're saying is I'm a bad stand-up comic, which is true. I am a really bad stand-up comic. Uh, we, th we thought we heard Microsoft say they'd never create another numbered version of Windows, meaning they would just make big changes to in the uh, updates. Yeah, yeah, they did say that. What was that, about a decade ago? Um, people change their minds. Different products come in, and my guess is that the uh, business people looked at it and said, well, dang it, we're not making enough money on Windows anymore because we haven't had a new version of Windows in a while. So let's increment the number. And uh, also, given that there are some significant UI changes, uh, it's a good question. Uh, given that there are some significant UI changes, I think that they may want to increment the number just to just because I, I get the feeling that not a lot of people are going to like the visual changes in Windows 11. At the very least, it'll take them a while to get used to. At the very worst, there will be a revolt. <laughs> so, our Microsoft, are you live? Yes, we're live. We may even be living. <laughs> what happened to Windows 9? I think, I know that you're joking about that, but my recollection was that they wanted to skip the number 9 because a lot of code had checks to see if you were running Windows 95 or Windows 98 by saying Win 9 as opposed to actually looking at major version numbers. But that could be completely apophrical. I just remember hearing that at some point, that there, there was a fair amount of software still out in the world which would look for version of uh, Windows based off of name. I need to make the database exclusive for a login that crashed as if other processes are slowing it down. So is this uh, your login or is this some application login? Our Necrosoft, that's... And is it going to be you who's making that change? Okay, app login, are you gonna be trying to code that into the application itself? Because I'm... I, I would like to hear, I just need a temp exclusive. Okay, so you could um, alter database and set single user to run a batch job. Yeah, you could alter database, set single user, and immediately execute a query so that hopefully you get the single user. The problem is that in the event that between the time you say go, and you run your next query, if some other process has come in and, and jumped, uh, it owns the single user thread. So that may be a little bit of a concern if you have an extremely busy server. 
Can I set it single to a login? Exclusive user. My my recollection is no, that you can't set to an exclusive user. Uh, you could you could use the DAC. Um, you could disable all the all other logins. And set to single user, but yeah, you're not going to be able to say only allow user Bob to uh, to open a connection now, not not within SQL Server. Though, as Mala and Solomon both mentioned, the DAC is uh, a possibility here, but otherwise, um, especially if it's if it's sort of I just need to get this thing done once set single user mode immediately execute a query right after that hopefully nobody else has jumped the line and then you can run your process in single user mode and then three years from now when you have to explain it to the next dba and explain that this was definitely a temporary idea uh we'll feel for you So uh, Mike mentioned here that no, this was before the Windows 8, Windows 10 debacle. I recall it being with Windows 10, that 10 was going to be the last version because you had 8 and 8.1 and then 10 was the last. So Solomon says, of course they used, told everyone to use SQL CLR instead of extended stored procedures and Olay automation as it is much better than those two, which is true by the way. And they haven't removed those clearly worse options, so I'm not sure how they would remove SQL CLR. They might not remove it, but they may not support later versions of .NET. It may be that, oh, we only support .NET Framework. We're not going to support .NET Core. Yeah. And so if .NET Framework stops being readily available, then you have a problem. Now that said, .NET Framework is going to be readily available for a very long time. Um, you're going to have people using the .NET Framework for decades. You know, all of this, this code, web forms, for example. I mean, we've still got web forms, a lot of web form servers hanging around, application servers. Uh, there's still a lot of stuff that uses UI libraries that are only in .NET Framework that were not brought over to .NET Core because they weren't really core libraries. And you don't necessarily have a good additional library that fits on top of it. Some of the older, uh, older libraries in .NET Framework that have been replaced, you know, they're not going to be ported over to Core. So I expect to see a fair amount of code for the next few two to three decades that uses .NET Framework. And as long as that's available, you'll be able to find ways to get .NET Framework. And that may be enough to keep SQL CLR puttering along just barely. But, you know, given the de-emphasis on CLR in Azure SQL Database, where you can't use SQL CLR. I don't think it's high on their list of stuff to get right or stuff to change. I get the feeling that you're going to have a combination of them saying, this may be stuff that you don't want to do within the database itself and use the extensibility framework. So that is probably closer to where any .NET Core uh, integration might come from. Anybody have an infographic of Microsoft library families as a timeline or other form? I've not seen one. I mean, I remember the old Visual Studio days where you buy Here's your copy of Visual Studio 2003, and it would have a big fold out, which had all of the different uh, libraries in there. But certainly not over time. 
mean, there's there are a lot of libraries in there. I think they've even discontinued the systems um, chart that we used to have. Those days, everybody who's a DBA had a chart like that on on your desk on how, how the system tables are laid out. Oh yeah. I don't. Yeah, I I don't think they have even that now. It's all gone. <laughs> After yeah, Azure yeah. and everything, yeah. So they they do have those sorts of things for um, for .NET, but uh, I I haven't I haven't had a need to look in a while, and you know I suppose Microsoft Docs might be one of the better places to look if you just if you wanted the listing, but if you wanted to understand how things fit together as as an image for an architect, then I I just remember the fold out maps from older versions of Visual Studio. So Solomon says not updating SQL CLR is a huge mistake given that they're letting other relational databases take a lead in the extensibility area. It's sad that they won't hire someone who understands SQL CLR and isn't afraid to touch it. I agree. I sincerely wish that there were better uh, integration options for languages. I think that's that is an area where Postgres is uh, definitely in the catbird seat, where I can write these functions in quite a few different languages. I can write these procedures in different languages. I can have uh, data centric code that doesn't have to be in a SQL variant. I could write it in C. I could write it in Python. I can write it in some other language. And it will integrate, it'll run within the scope of this process as opposed to uh, ML services, which is outside of process. There are risks in there. And the one of the risks is I can write code that can actively harm my Postgres server. I can take it down on accident by calling this, uh, this function. So it's not a perfect answer, but it opens up the ability to do a lot of data-centric development where the Microsoft answer too often is pull the data out of the database, do all of the work, put it back into the database. So Mike says, I think one of the biggest messes in the world is Microsoft Docs. And it's mostly because of the versions and lack of search with timeline reference. There is, yeah, there is a bit of a problem there. And also that even if you specifically look for a particular version, you might get other versions of information. And understanding the nuances, you know, like for example, this thing changed in SQL Server 2016, except that in SP1 of 2016, it looked like this. And then in SP1CU5, it, it changed just a little bit. And it's hard to note all of these changes that happen over time. And it's, it can be hard to remember that, oh, well, in SP1CU5, this piece of functionality, this API changed ever so slightly. And then you're running some code that's SP1CU4 that you swear is working because you've got a fully patched server elsewhere, and yet it's breaking over here. And Microsoft Docs says it should be working just fine. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I get your point for sure. Yeah, and I, I remember I was looking at Postgres the other day and it was pretty good. It's very clear, like you're looking at 4.1, the most current is da 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 in red. Kind of. Did you all use books online? The presentation I, I, from the docs team, I think it's been rescheduled for January 2022. So keep all your feedback handy. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. What were you saying, Mike? I had, to, being new to SQL Server, I, people keep referencing books online, and I had no idea what they were talking about. It's Microsoft Docs. Yes, no, understood, but it was just such a weird terminology. It was like... Because books they're are old. online. They're old, like me. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like they probably named it before a lot yes. of documentation had gone online. It was just like came in the application and the help section. 
Yeah, so um, so Mike, the way that came about was you buy SQL Server 7 and you could get the books. The Microsoft documentation is a set of books. And eventually with say SQL Server 2000 or 2005, you got a CD-ROM of the books, but you could also get the same books on the internet by going to this Microsoft website. So that's books online. Um, I think they may have even called books online the CD version of it, where you could you could uh, have it at your fingertips on your computer by pressing F1. Yeah, Kathy Kellenberger references it a lot, and I just was like, what is that? I, I know what it is now, but I, I, I was just confused by it. I'm like, what? Yep. It's it's the, a, I mean, even Bakuri referenced it recently on the on the show they had um, on uh, Dem Connections. So I'm no, no longer embarrassed that I call it that from time to time. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what version is Azure SQL databases, the cheap one, and how do they upgrade? Do you get a, new, a warning in a sandbox with the new version? Version 12, and how do they upgrade? Behind the scenes without telling you. Do you get a warning? Perhaps. You might have to go check uh, their postings, but they essentially just do regular updates behind the scenes. You don't get sandboxes with new versions. The changes are considered to be minor and non-breaking, which, of course, can sometimes break. But it's not like a major version, major release of a box product. The last time Azure SQL Database has actually uh, had actually upgraded to a whole new version, I think was about 2016 when they went from V11 to V12. Everything since then has just consistently called itself V12. Okay, so Solomon's continued rant on CLR, which is completely fair. Uh, the debacle, the security debacle of SQL Server 2017, CLR strict security, is evidence that nobody there knows how, SQL, how CLR integration works, as that change was predicated on a scenario that doesn't exist. Oops. Yeah, it, it was... You know what, I'm just going to... Solomon, I'm just going to get your link. I'm going to get a link to your um, blog post about strict security because it was it was a bit of a mess. So let me close out by um, by finding that on on your website because that was an interesting whole mess of things. Will it remain 2019 forever? No, no. So version 12 is simply version 12 of Azure SQL database. Um, it doesn't tie to a version of the box product. It was V12 back in 2016. It was V12 in 2017 and V12 today. If it moves to V13, then you would be you would receive emails that talk about a new version. Uh, your Azure SQL database, if you create a new one, would allow you to choose versions. The last time they've had to, to do this was back with uh, V11 to V12, and there was an explicit migration process for that. But since you've gone on, since they went on to V12, they haven't really had an upgrade path. It's always been consistent behind the scenes They'll they'll do uh, minor change point updates without telling you. It's not a fixed box product where you control all of the updates yourself. It's all done under covers behind the scenes. Yes, I don't believe they they know that said scenario doesn't exist as I haven't written that up yet. <laughs> Uh, possibly. And, you know, again, in fairness, in fairness, um, it's, it is a difficult matter because CLR is, I imagine, not 
easy code to work with. And it's also uh, 15 years old at this point. It's probably buried in a section that not many people know about. And not a lot of people on that team are going to know about. So that's the tricky part. And Mala's gonna take out, uh, get out of here, and we should probably get out of here as well. Before I do that, let me drop in these last links here. Oh, see, Solomon did it already. Here's part one, he's got part four. I'm gonna give you parts two and three. There we go. And those go back a few years. So yeah, this stuff hasn't changed. Uh, SQL Server 20, I call BS on that given that I found the info without having the source code. Yes, but you understand what's going on. Um, you know, they, they don't have people who dive into that part of the source code and don't understand the mechanics of, of it. And yeah, you know, I, I agree with you that, yeah, there, there should be people there who do, there should be enough people there who do that they shouldn't make what I think is a big mistake. Um, that by the way, if you want to know how big of a mistake, that four part series will give you a pretty good understanding of it. Um, but I also don't want to trash them too hard because it's an, a positive spin. It's an underappreciated part of SQL Server, uh, both from the product team standpoint and from end users. So not going to be a lot of love for it. There's, there's not a lot of demand for it. Product managers aren't going to push it and developers aren't going to dive into it as a result. And <laughs> yeah, other days, other, uh, other relational databases have been doing this for a long time. They have been doing it well. Postgres does a great job of it. Even hated mortal nemesis Oracle does a really good job of this. And I think it is a part where SQL Server falls behind and has consistently fallen behind for quite some time. Well, maybe it'll come back as Power CLR and they'll totally rebrand it. There you go. That's that may be the way that we get it. Power CLR. So with that, we're gonna wrap up for tonight. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully you have a wonderful evening. Uh, remember that next Tuesday, we're going to have our advanced DBA meeting. Tim Radney is gonna to talk to us about sizing Azure VMs. And <laughs> Mike's already excited. And then from there, we're gonna have the rest of the uh, meetings for this month. So we've got them all lined up, ready, ready to roll. We hope to see you another time. Until then, everybody, have a great evening.